Now, sculpture and singing fountains. Look, stranger. Frank Roper and his wife, Nora, moved to South Wales nearly 30 years ago when he became vice-principal of Cardiff College of Art. He retired slightly early from teaching and is now a sculptor full-time. The Ropers still live in a large family house, although their two daughters have left home and married. Frank's workshops are on the ground floor. Rene, I want to introduce a whiff of a graveyard and a spot yeah. behind it. Yeah. And I wonder whether I've already overdone the... Ivy. I don't uh, think so. I think you could do with a bit more, yes. You think? Yeah, I think so. Wait, that's right. A suggestion of a bracelet, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, she's rather charming, though. She started as a mask. Then I poised her on an arm, I thought rather elegantly, and then thought of whether she was alive or dead. Now, this is polystyrene, isn't it? Yes. And you carve these thick pieces out of a block, I suppose, yeah? Cut them out of a block, yeah. Um, with homemade rifflers and sandpaper. Yes. Saw them and, um, so that I can get the subtle modelling. The hair is made out of sheet, polystyrene, too yeah. over the hot, silvering yeah. iron. You see, the thing is already almost an aluminium casting. Yes, of course. Now, and then this is the thing you cast in the end? Direct from this. Yeah. And if the casting fails, I've lost the model. I like to use polystyrene. This is the most direct means of casting. One can enjoy the modelling and realise that the casting is very little effort. Very much sense. Once I've got the thing in polystyrene, it's almost finished. So the polystyrene is sunk into sand. I use dry sand from one of the beaches down here. We pour metal on top. Then the polystyrene vaporizes. The metal fills the space where the polystyrene was, and we're left with an aluminium casting. Frank's assistant, Maurice Carey, helps with the casting, among other things. He has to make sure that the density of the sand is right without damaging the model, which is very delicate. The sculpture has a polystyrene runner attached to it at the top, which forms a channel for the molten metal to flow through. Thank <laughs> you. 
Back of superstition with Jerry Lane. Uh, I do. That's loud. All right. Just lifting. Is it? Oh, Christ, I can see something coming out. This is life or death as a polystyrene just burns away. It just becomes a gas. Stop, anyway. Which has to be driven into the sand by the pressure of metal. I see. So a, and the sand, the dry sand, has to be held up by the gas pressure. Yeah. Until the metal comes and uh, does the supporting. The inside the mould must be rather exciting. <laughs> I invented this dry sand system about, uh, I should think, 12 or 15 years ago. Yeah. It's used quite a lot now. How did it all start? Why did you become a sculptor? Well, I think probably I was a little bit dim. I think it would have been rather nice if I'd done something like mathematics or been in a very clever at languages. But I think I was a practical chap. And probably rather a sentimental romantic. But did it have fellow. anything to do with the way your family was pointed? Yes, actually, my grandfather made the thing possible. Uh, he was, he had a, a, a stone carving shop with quite a lot of nice mechanical apparatus, steam engines and so on, something like 40 carvers. Um, I suppose they carved mill owners, facades to the mill owners' mansions. And, Where was this then? Uh, Howarth in ah, Yorkshire. The Brontes place? Quite, yeah. quite. Uh, and so, with the uh, stone carving in the workshop to play in as a child, it was quite easy and obvious that I should uh, yeah. play with stone myself and fall in love with three-dimensional objects. My grandfather was quite an artist. I have one of his carvings in the garden, the dog you might have seen. And I think Shaw said something which seemed to have hit my father about some teach and some do was it sure? Those who can do, those, those who, who can. can't teach. That's right. Yeah. So teaching was rather a place safe thing. And uh, to make a living as a sculptor was slightly adventurous. So I did uh, find, uh, arrange several strings to my bow. Yeah. So I am a silversmith. I'm a very keen letter cutter. Pottery. I'm quite an expert potter. So if the one fails, the other's available, so one can make a living as a sculptor, you see. This is all very old-fashioned. Um, Did you find it was easy to start? Did you start by making a living as a sculptor? Right. From the Royal College, I had three commissions lined up. And if the damn war hadn't broken out, I yeah. should have never gone into teaching. Well, what I'd done all along is taught 
thinking that it was a temporary measure and that any moment I should step out and, uh, and make a, the living as a sculptor. Uh, inflations kept pace with the whole situation and uh, anyway, a few years ago I decided to get out now or never, so I, I got out. So now I am free to mind my own business and play my own games. <laughs> As well as making figures to amuse himself and other people, Frank has made sculptures for cathedrals and churches all over the country. At nearby Llanduff Cathedral in Cardiff, the architect has commissioned several pieces from him. The roof was damaged during the war and had to be supported by a new arch. A better known sculptor, Epstein, was asked to make a huge figure to decorate this arch. Well, aluminium, your metal. Not, of course, cast in the same way that you do it, but uh, what do you think he's done with it, Epstein? Do you think he's, do, he's done well with the aluminium? I think so. Epstein was very metal conscious, very material conscious, but I don't think he had much experience of working in aluminium. But this is probably the only one in Why aluminium. did he do it in aluminium, do you suppose? Cheap. Yeah. For a massive figure. Yeah. Uh, I think he's handled it rather well. I like the simplified treatment. This is the official medieval coat of arms that Frank made for the Bishop of Flanders. I modelled it direct in wax, which allows me to be rather light-hearted in the style. Then the thing is invested in a, a plaster mould and fired and cast in bronze. This is the old-fashioned sort of process, for This is a lost wax process. Yes, lost wax. And, uh, Tell just... me what the difference wax actually makes to your handling of the thing. Much, much lighter. Yeah. Less, less massive than aluminium. Well, this was commissioned something like five years ago. St. Tylo was offered as much land as he could travel around within 24 hours, so he chose a stag to ride. Here he's tempted by beautiful ladies, but you notice that he's turned his back on them and he's praying. This one, he's planting a very famous avenue of apple trees in Brittany. There was a strong link between Wales and Brittany in early medieval times. Here he's setting off for the Holy Land and a very unseaworthy boat. Here, this, I think, they were offered rewards. I don't know details of that story. But here he was offered a silver chair, a golden chair and a wooden chair. And being a very worthy saint, naturally, he chose the wooden chair. In a valley near Cardiff is the church of Michelston le Pitt. Frank was asked by a local family to make a stained glass window depicting St. Francis of Assisi. He has had several windows commissioned by other people. Windows are normally, they use lead. And a lead window is quite floppy. It's quite weak and they, de they deteriorate, the glass expands and the lead expands and the things began to sag. Now these are cast in aluminium, it's quite a different concept. Perfectly rigid for all time. In fact, they could, if they were cast heavily, they could be structural as part of the buildings. And another important thing about them is that they are primarily sculpture. So at, at night when there's no light coming in from outside, we have a nice relief, an interesting relief.
When Frank was a lad in Haworth in Yorkshire, you had to be tough. It was more than a bit sissy to be artistic. I think the arts were a closed book completely. I remember going for piano lessons. And the thing was to either go around in the fields outside the village and avoid the village centre, or wear tennis shoes and run like mad. Craftsmanship, and good craftsmanship, tremendous respect. But um, I don't think the arts flourish in that weather, and, uh, and on hills like that, where people are doing it. When I was a child, they were probably doing a 12-hour day, you know. They came home for breakfast when I went to school. They were coming home to, to breakfast, you see, having already done a couple of hours' work. So the arts, poetry, music, no. <laughs> Craftsmanship, always, and good building. Tremendous respect. Nora chooses the coloured glass for the windows. It's then marked up, cut, and fitted into the cast frame by Morris. It's neutral colour. And then we have the blue next. Morris was a student with me for years and then insisted on coming to work here. sympathetic. Um, he helps with the casting and the engineering, the building, particularly when we go out fixing things. You know, his father's a builder and building work is in his blood. You know. Oh, and he's critical and encouraging, sympathetic. He's a very nice chap to have about. Oh, that's fine. That looks good. Oh, I mean, I would regard Frank as my benefactor, really, in the old sense of the word. And in fact, I've learned everything from Frank. Um, from morals to skills to, you know, artistic appreciation, everything. As Frank said, now that he's retired, he's free to play his own games, and Morris is happy enough to join in. I've been involved in the lion from its conception. The very name of the lion, Lethal, it, it kind of sums it up. And he's always been a great challenge to make him uh, alternate. I mean, that was, that was the first thing, that it was um, a desire to build um, the kind of muscle control within, a, within an animal and try and put it into a machine. You see, it almost works, you know, and it's that nice combination between the wheels and the, and the uh, legs that um, they're such a lot of fun, I think. Stop. You know, I think it's rather a delightful shape. I'm very pleased with it. The relationship of the speed of the wheel on top and the turbine moving much faster. Yes. I like the column. Yes. And the accommodation of the wheel. This is all justified by the sound it's producing. Yes. This is one of Frank's musical machines. <laughs> the sound is produced by water displacing air in metal pipes. say they're something like toys, these things of yours. Right. Well, I think it is possible that they are toys. I think that um, as a youngster, we were being very careful. We were looking for... My parents were watching for the rainy day and they were going to be fiercely independent and dependent on nobody, so they had to be... I think they liked to have money in hand. We didn't have money to spare for nonsense. And so there were no toys. And I rather think that I am probably still making the toys I didn't get as a kid, you know. I think I'd still like to make a steam engine, actually. Yes? <laughs> we always have children about, and we have fun offering sixpences for, for people who uh, tell us how things work. And this is half the fun of us, the fun of how do they work, how do they make the noise. And uh, often the kids 
produce the answers before their fathers. But this isn't quite an entertainment. These are Frank's singing fountains. We've been to Camden Art Centre, the Summer Festival, Florence, three or four exhibitions in London parks. They have to be open air exhibitions because the things tend to um, splash a little bit. In Italy, I could have sold a lot easily if it hadn't been for import due to restrictions. In Britain, I think it's probably due to the weather, people's attitude to their gardens or something. They don't sell very readily, but they should. You see, we have this great advantage of doing our own casting. Otherwise, we should never be able to make them. So the end thing is, end product is in cast aluminium, and we're in control of the whole production. So we model them in polystyrene, we cast them in aluminium, we have lathes and drills, etc., and we're able to do the engineering and put them together. So they do have rather a reference to early Victorian engineering. Frank's wife has a theory about these conceptions. Oh, I think it's a deep-seated interest in mechanical things as well as the art that's given him... Uh, he used to play with pumps and things, you know, at one time, and he uh, was delighted when he found he could combine the art and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the mechanics. Because he's a great inventor and, and you can't get to sleep at night, you know, he, he works out ways of moving water and making noises and things, so I think it keeps him happy. Nora paints all the fountains herself. Nora, before I went to college in Keithley, she came from Grassington, and uh, I came from Howarth, and we converged on Keithley School of Art. And then I think I went to college a year before her, and she caught me up there. <laughs> we re-met there, yeah. She just uh, responds to these shapes, and I think she likes an excuse now to, uh, to experiment with colour. Rennie, come and look at my mountain pool. <laughs> yeah. What started you off making this sort of thing? An escape from art, the thing which one gets so thoroughly bored with in an art school. Yes. Art with capital letters. In fact, it's a sort of game. Playing with shapes and also playing with mechanics, isn't it? Quite. And, and they function. What I was involved with here was to try to reproduce the sound from a mountain stream. Yes. And so I had to produce the right taper. Any, a particular here. mountain stream, you mean? Quite. I took a friend into the Black Mountains, a chap who played in a London orchestra, and he was enraptured uh, by a natural sound from a mountain stream in the Black Mountains. And I decided that I must try to reproduce this. It had a sort of rock amplification in it or something. I it must have done. Yeah. This, this is my best attempt to produce the... And is it as good as the stream? Not at all. No. I don't know what they did. I've consulted everybody about my shapes here. Yeah. The university and, and um, read quite a lot of textbooks. Actually, I'm only dead on certain notes. Yes. It's not bad. This represents the bracken. Yeah. And this is the overhanging material. Yeah. And the sound isn't bad. No, it's, it's much louder thing. and more musical than an ordinary drip, I will say. Yes, yeah. yes. But you don't think it's as good as the stream? Certain low notes are missing. It's all nice, though. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's, it's an art directed by an end product, which is a mountain stream. It's functional. It's quite, yeah. quite. Yeah. <laughs>
Frank Roper is still producing sculptures. His work adorns many cathedrals and churches throughout Britain. And last year he received an MBE for his services to art. And on Friday the story of a young man who decided to restore an unexploited area of the Isle of Skye to its ancient past. A future for the past in Look Straight.